Oh, don't mind my home security system. Down, Rusty. Can't be too careful with all those weirdos around. This episode of Film Asylum is brought to you by... I'm just kidding. We don't have any sponsors. <laughs> Who the fuck do you think we are? Are you like, kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I actually believed it for a moment there. I was going to say, we got a sponsor? Surprise! <laughs> Happy New Year, yeah. sort of. <laughs> well, this is our first one of the year. First episode of 2020, Film Asylum. We are going to be talking about our first animated movie yet, guys. Mm -hmm. And that is 1993's Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Great movie. This movie was based off of the animated series. It was created by Bruce Timm and Eric Radomski. Bruce Timm was working for, uh, I believe it was the Fox Kids Network, or whatever Fox was doing at the time, and they had a Warner Brothers branch, and he had worked on little cartoons in the 80s, like Masters of the Universe, I think G.I. Joe was another one, and he was a little frustrated because the animation that they were doing at that time was looking a little too realistic, and he wanted to spread his wings, and when the opportunity for Batman came around, he made his pitch, and he worked with Eric Radomski, who was the artist more. He actually came up with some really cool ideas, like instead of using white paper, they used black paper to draw on, and the color was used to bring out the lights and create more shadows. It was really neat, and it made the animated series look very different and separate itself from other cartoons at the time. Honestly, it's probably the most memorable thing about that show is, like, the animation. Because, like, if you think about 90s Batman, you're automatically going to think of that show. Like, yeah, granted, we got Keaton's Batman, but this stands out more, as messed up as it sounds, because of, like, the way it looks. Like, the, the feel about it. Like, yes, it was a little bit darker due to the fact of black paper. But in reality, like, <laughs> they took on a lot more darker things and put it in a kid's show than what was going on at the time. Like, we had Turtles, Ghostbusters, G.I. Joe. All uh, those classics. Yeah, they're all classics, but yet they weren't to the concept of, well, yeah, we can bring in a darker concept into a show and use it, but we're going to try to keep it on the lighter side. They did it perfectly. Like It was made in the 90s, and it almost felt like a 1940s noir vibe because the one thing that this animated show nailed was the detective aspect of Batman. They made him look like an actual detective, and he actually operated like one, because that's how he was in the comics back in the 60s. Some of the live-action films got that to a degree, but Joel Schumacher once skipped that completely. <laughs> no, there is no, there is no detective Batman in the Joel Schumacher movies. Just throw that out the window. But, you know, even like in um, Tim Burton's Batman films, you can definitely tell that he had that detective aspect when he was trying to figure out who the Joker was, as well as Penguin and Catwoman. But that's the biggest thing that... The takeaway from the animated series is that he is a detective. Yes, that is correct. They talked to Bob Kane, and he had said that his inspirations were Zorro and Sherlock Holmes because Batman originally had a gun, and he had seen the shadow, and the shadow had a gun, but I believe it was Bob Kane's editor who approached him and said, we don't think a vigilante should be killing people anymore, so they took the guns away had him use his intellect and gadgets a little more, and now we got Batman the way we know him as he is today. Right, I'm going to point this out. Everyone says Batman doesn't kill anybody, but him beating the living shit out of you and then leaving you somewhere, you're going to fucking die, all right? I don't care. <laughs> no, I don't kill him. No, you just broke his fucking arms. You beat the fuck out of him and you left him there. Gave him a depressed skull yeah. fracture. He's bleeding Dude, in the he head. He is not living anymore. <laughs> there is no way he didn't kill that guy like 10 minutes ago. Like, I'm going to jump off the roof. All right, let's do this. He's locked up now. No, he just fucking died from a concussion. Or he's well, got severe brain trauma. <laughs> well, maybe when he left him there, he was still alive, and he said, see, I didn't kill him. <laughs> the loss of blood killed him. <laughs> but if you do look at the original art of 
the Batman and like original art of uh, Bob Kane, like it really actually shows like Adam West was the best person for the portrayal at that time. Oh, oh, absolutely. Because like everything yes. po- screams Adam West, like the way the hair is, the look, the build, everything. Mm-hmm. But that, that's a whole another show, man. I'm like I different can, decade. I, yeah. <laughs> It, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that show's still classic. It is. I still watch it. <laughs> Honestly, I was, wa- I was watching the movie the other day, so I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Shark Repellent. Shark Repellent. Yeah. That's the one thing that stands out. <laughs> uh, the hell was it? The Killer oh. Batmobile. Hell, even in the new Harley Quinn show, they brought back the Shark Repellent. Nice. Did they really? Yeah, I There's died. There's a shark character in that Yeah, it's King Shark. Show. King Shark. It is King Shark. And that's okay. what he uses it on is actually King Shark because he's, oh, he's fighting God. Harley Quinn. And then all of a sudden, King Shark comes after him. He pulls a shark repellent out and sprays his fucker in the face. <laughs> I'm, I'm losing it this time because it was something I was not expecting. It was like, well, you, whoever made this show was obviously a big fan of everything. So. That's perfect. And that's what Bruce Tim was. He was a huge fan of Batman. So he was excited to be working on the animated series project. He was also excited not just to do his own little twist of the cartoon and make the animation his own thing and make it unique unique and different and he was excited to put more violence and make it more real in the substance of it uh before they said you couldn't even make a fist in kids cartoons they made fists you actually saw them physically hit each other and fight each other yeah they did (laughs) most of the weapons they used at that time were lasers or some kind of magic they used real ammunition in this they even made a a drawing where it had a bunch of like censorship issues or anything that went against what they were actually allowed to do. It's like Batman protecting a child while he's strangling the Joker and Joker shooting at him and Catwoman looks like she's naked and there's an alcohol bottle. And it, there was like everything and anything that you can't put into a kid's cartoon, child endangerment, live ammunition, strangulation, drugs, nudity, smoking... I think religion was another thing. <laughs> they were just like, fuck it. We're just going to throw everything in this one picture go, this is our show. And it was glorious. <laughs> Honestly, I think the best thing that came out of this show is Harley Quinn because up to that point, no one had her and she became a good staple in it because Miss... she was a fun character. Mr. J. <laughs> the show was an innovator for Batman in itself. It was really neat because I think it was Paul Dini who created Harley Quinn. And she was supposed to be a one-off character, but they liked her so much. They brought her back, and fans liked her so much. And now she's right up there, almost top ten or five of greatest Batman villains now. When truthfully, she was a sidekick. Up to, I want to say, mid-2000s is when she finally broke off and did her own thing because... She was always Joker's sidekick. He always abused her. I don't understand why everyone says, I'm going to be this girl's Joker. No, he's a fucking abusive fuck. No, just leave her alone. Let her be her strong character that she really is. Like, I still think one of the best stories they did was, it was a Valentine's Day issue. She breaks out of Arkham to go kill Joker uh, Joker, because she's that pissed he never came and rescued her. Nice. And it shows that at that point, she would rather go and fucking kill him to be done with him and she literally brought Joker's ass back to Arkham and then sat in her cell. Because Batman's chasing her through the whole That's crazy. issue. And then all of a sudden they're like, they're both at Arkham. And she's sitting there. Joker's beat the fuck. And, he, <laughs> and she's sitting in her cell like nothing happened. I'm like, that's what I needed. Seriously, like, I mean, look, look how far we've come. I and mean, we got Harley Quinn and the fabulous emancipation of Harley Quinn with Birds of Prey coming out soon. She's got her own ragtag team. And she's oh, yeah. leading her own movie now when she used to be a sidekick. I would say even the shitty Suicide Squad movie put her out front. But it wasn't, she wasn't herself. It was like she was still part of the team. Where this one, she's actually leading a team. Dude, she has her own comic series. Like, she was part of the Gotham City Sirens, which brought in her... Um, Poison Ivy and Catwoman, which was nice to see, like, three really strong characters being themselves. That was another thing about the animated series. When they teamed Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy together, I don't think they thought in a million years that that was going to be, like, one of the ultimate villain tag teams of all time. It's it's become phenomenal for what it's done. They came out of left field, and it's like they were such a strong, bonded characters that, like, yeah, dude, they were they became really good friends. Like even the fact that she would protect her from the Joker was even a bigger thing. And I was like, the the show itself was like That's there's depth. so much in there that they just kind of like glanced over like, "Oh, yeah, this is happening now." Yeah. But yeah, like as 
as the kids, we didn't notice it, but as adults, as we're watching it again now, it, it makes me feel like we missed out on a lot. But here's the thing about the animated show that I think a lot of people miss out is, yes, it was a kid's show, but it was also made for adults. I still remember my dad saying, yo, this was a really good show. Like, he didn't even say it was a cartoon. It was a really good show. It still is a great show. It is. And that's what sets it apart from other kid shows. That's why it can live on. If you ever notice, yeah, I understand that there are things that are made specifically for kids. But look at stuff that is made that catches children's attention, but it's made for a mature and an adult crowd. And yet it's usually that stuff that lives on and on forever. Like Terminator's an example. Kids love it. It was made for adults, but yet you can market it towards kids. RoboCop was another one. Arcade games. I'd say Ghostbusters alone. Perfect example. Another big one is the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because the original comics to those Ninja Turtles was really dark, and they weren't afraid to kill people in those comics. No, yeah, they did kill people. (laughs) Those comics reminded me of how Deadpool the movie was. It was, was overly violent. You saw... Leonardo stabbed the shit out of people, and that's how it was. They had smart-ass comments, and they murdered people. Well, foot ninjas, but still. (laughs) Foot ninjas. They fucking deserved it. (laughs) And a lot of people don't know that because it's the the animated cartoon that came first. It was all lighthearted, 80s camp, made for kids. And they watered it down. And then when the movie came out, they thought, nobody's going to like this movie. It's going to bomb. It wasn't even... That original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie wasn't even a studio movie. It was an independent movie. The 80s cartoon was a phenomenon in itself. Why wouldn't a studio make that into a movie? Nobody wanted to give it the time of day. It, that movie still holds up so well. They used Jim Henson's Creature uh, Puppets, or I don't, uh, Creature Studio, creature studio yeah. to make those costumes. And I remember as a kid, it was like, oh my God, they look real. It, yeah. You actually thought the Ninja Turtles were real, and it had substance to it. It didn't hold anything back. They used their weapons. There was some adult humor to it, and the shots in that movie were phenomenal. Is it perfect? No, but it's a very entertaining, and it can be inspirational, but it really has a lot of heart deep down in its core, and it's made for adults and kids. You could tell they tried, and they put a lot of effort into it, absolutely. It's a great film, and that's what I think this Batman animated series was. It was made for a kids and adults, and it was innovative. It holds up so well to this day. It created new characters. It also did something else that was very important. It gave Mr. Freeze more of a character. Before, in the comic books, he was nothing more than a mere mad scientist gone bad that froze people and robbed banks or whatever. Here, they gave him a tragic backstory about his wife was dying, he tried to save her, and corporate America said, no way, we don't care, we care more about our money, screw your wife, screw you, pull the plug. And he does everything and anything he can to save her. And then an accident happens, and he gets turned into Mr. Freeze. He thinks his wife is dead. That sets him off the deep end. And now we have this amazing character arc, and it gives so much more to the character that you actually feel for Mr. Freeze. Oh, yeah. He, be, he is one of the most underrated villains, but he's also a villain of circumstance. But not portrayed well in the Joel so, Schumacher so movie. Robin I knew he right. was going to it. They did it right. No, they did not. <laughs> they cast Arnold as fucking Mr. Freeze and turned him into punny they fucking Mr. Freeze. All right? Mr. Olympus into Mr. Freeze. No, that is not the way he is. I'm sitting uh, over here. I could see him squirming. Like, I knew he was going to bring it up. Colin's bringing up all the pinpoints. I'm like, doesn't Batman and Robin have that? Sort of, but not really. <laughs> The story was there, but it wasn't executed. <laughs> well. Yes, that's the point. Everybody <laughs> chill. <laughs> All right, everyone. What killed the dinosaurs? <laughs> the Ice, Ice Age. <laughs> oh, and, and, he was and just a Bane. Pun machine. Bane well, in that movie. Well, we don't have to talk we about Bane. Really end end it. End it. End it. Just we're gonna stop there. But I was actually shocked to find out this movie was PG. I actually thought it was PG thirteen because of the guns that are being used to shoot at Batman as well as the other criminals. The fact that there is quite a bit of blood, 
You know, Batman is bloodied and scarred up, as well as oh. Joker getting punches to the face. And then there are also off-camera deaths and on-camera deaths. One guy gets crushed by a statue. Oh, yeah. And then Joker kills the one mob boss by infusing his laughing gas, and he has a permanent smile. And then all of a sudden, he blows up with a bomb strapped to his chest. I actually thought this was PG-13. The funny thing about Batman Mask of the Phantasm was this was supposed to be a straight-to-video movie. It was, yes. And then towards the last minute... They said, no, we're going to make this a theatrical release. Okay. And Tim and Radomski were really excited because, you know, like I said about the censorship picture, they could take now what they wanted to do more in Mask of the Phantasm because it was going to be a theatrical release and a movie <laughs> than what they couldn't do with it in the show, which was, like you said, it made it more exciting and you saw things that you didn't think we're gonna see it makes it actually steps up the movie a little more because you knew it was from a show mm -hmm. and it's kind of like a good sequel where it adds on it's not the same rehashing of the the original first movie it's right there's blood there's more violence there's even inside adult humor like at one point uh hart bachner who does the voice of arthur reeves mm -hmm. He's a politician who has an issue with Batman. <coughs> he goes to a party at Wayne Manor. A girl has just thrown a drink in Bruce's face. Mm -hmm. Bruce Wayne's walking away. Arthur hands him a handkerchief, and he's giving him some, like, oh, I'm so better than you kind of quips and stuff. Right. And Bruce Wayne says, thanks for the handkerchief, Arthur. You know where you can stick it. Uh, As he's jamming it in his pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't make it a trifolder. It just like shoves it in there. It's all wrinkled and everything. But here's the funny thing. You're talking about was it Arthur Reeves? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wasn't the dude that played Alice in Die Hard? Yes, yes. He was. So this correlation, this is our the last one of last year, the beginning of this year, is always gonna come back to Bruce Willis and Die Hard. I'm just saying it now. It's amazing. <laughs> this is some six degrees with Kevin Bacon shit. <laughs> Bruce fucking Willis. Bruce, Bruce motherfucking Willis. Willis. <laughs> As you all can tell, we're huge Bruce Willis yeah, fans. Listen, I want him to play Freeze in the next movie. I don't care. <laughs> Years ago, I thought he would have been an awesome Batman. I think he has the Bruce Wayne look. You know he can kick ass. I think he could, totally could have pulled it off. I think he would also be a great older Bruce Wayne if they ever do a Batman older Beyond Bruce movie. Wayne, yes. Mm -hmm. Or... Michael Keaton. <laughs> Michael Keaton, who still says to this day, I'm Batman. And when he says it, I believe him. <laughs> I honestly believe him. Like, he will give this speech at his college for commencement speeches. The first thing out of his words were, I'm Batman. And he'll, the last. Yeah, exactly. He'll go on talk shows and say, I'm Batman. Yes, I know I'm playing the vulture in the new Spider-Man movie, but I'm Batman. <laughs> <laughs> and without the Tim Burton movie with Michael Keaton, we wouldn't have had the animated series itself either. Because uh, a lot of what you see in the Tim Burton Batman movie is actually turned into animation. And the animated series was coming out around the same time Batman Returns was. Yes. That's why if you look at Batman Returns and the animated series, you'll see that the Penguin in both the movie and the animated series look an awful lot alike. Mm -hmm. I think there was even an episode where the giant duck was even in it. That's possible. Yeah, I think so. I believe it. Catwoman looks a heck of a lot like what she does in the movie, except it's not, like, There's no stitching. Leather. Like, leather <laughs> yeah. stitching. I don't even know like what that. you call yeah. it. See, honestly, but Adrian Barbeau did the, um, more of an amazing voice than Michelle Pfeiffer. I'm like, don't get me wrong, Michelle Pfeiffer's hot, but Adrian Barbeau's voice is makes that fucking character the voice casting in the show in the movie was perfect all right let's say dude we got kevin conroy and mark mark hamill, hamill. alone are the two biggest names like they're the only two because some people are still not alive but uh, they're only two that are still batman and joker like mm -hmm. they're the two tattoos i have of kevin conroy and mark hamill are joker and batman it's not going to change it's like those no. are our joker and batman they we're are. fucking in our 30s and we're still talking about batman all right it's gonna happen it's so great <laughs> hearing him in his interviews mark hamill about the character joker because he treats his laugh like it's a musical instrument every single ha ha or ho ho he he has a meaning to him and it's great there's one particular moment in the movie mask of the phantasm where he's laughing so much i wanted to see like footage of him in the recording studio using his full body using it to this big, huge, dramatic laugh as the building, as the whole town is exploding. I want to see him 
in that moment because I'm sure he's using his entire body to create the laugh. That's how much dedication he gives to this role. They said he stands when he does the Joker. Most of the time, actors sit down, they do their lines. They said he's up in the booth and he's acting out the motion. He's got to have energy. I mean, his character is always having energy, making quips and moving, and I, I believe it. Well, as an actor, people know that sometimes you do need to get that energy out and you do need to almost have that that release. It's kind of like an opera singer when you see them put their hands on their stomach when they're hitting high notes. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what he's doing for the character. Or, you know, when somebody says, I'll find my character when I find my wardrobe, mm -hmm. that's probably his wardrobe is to act it out to get his whole body into it and then that projects the whole character in that audio recording. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that was the first time I met Mark Hamill was through the show. It wasn't Star Wars. It was Batman the Animated Series. Ooh. Oh, That's crazy. This is like Luke Skywalker. I was like, dude, as much as I am a big Star Wars fan, I always am going to refer to him as Joker. He's not Luke to me. He's fucking Joker. Like, even in the encyclopedia for the Joker, he does the intro, like the introduction of everything. And it is amazing. It's so cool. Because, like, he is everyone's Joker. I don't care who you are. If I ever met him and would get an autograph from him and get an 8x10 glossy, it would be of the Joker. Oh, absolutely. Probably for me, too, as well. I'm going to admit that. Because I love Jack Nicholson. I love Heath Ledger's performance. But I do agree with a lot of people that I feel like because we know that drawing... Because the thing about the animated series as well is it's pretty true to the comic books. I mean, yeah, you see some of the inspiration from the Tim Burton movies, like we said, and... Penguin, Catwoman, even the Batmobile and the Batwing. It's known yeah. as the Batplane. It takes from Tim Burton stuff. But yet they have the the blue and gray Batman suit. Yes. Joker has his traditional looking Joker outfit. It's nothing new wave or different. It's And Mark Hamill's voice to that character, that's what you want to see. When you want to see something that you love that's a comic that's on a page and even though it's animation, it's still coming to life to a certain extent. Yeah. And that's what we get. It's kind of where your brain goes to is that it's damn near perfect, really. Are you, are you sure, though, that they're not also taken from the Cesar Romero Joker 2, that outfit? Because that kind of stands out. That's a very... It's a very identifiable yeah. outfit. Because, like, even, even with that and you got Nicholson's Joker, it's like they all kind of took from each other. But it's like the colors are so vibrant and, like, the Joker himself is that very vibrant character but they took inspiration from everything yeah even if you look at the show you see goofy things like i think there was a joker casino in one episode oh, and yeah. there were these like big elaborate like roulette tables mm -hmm. that was screaming the 60s show yes right. so, there was so much over the top stuff sometimes you're like really and you could get away with it in animation you could bring back those trademarks and little <laughs> tidbits and it didn't really cost that much because those sets were hugely expensive. So to have them back in the cartoon with a mix of the comics, mix of the movies at the time, it was this perfect melding pot of what Batman was. And for them to create their own characters like Harley Quinn, backstory <laughs> of Mr. Freeze. And now we get this character, the Phantasm, for a feature-length animated movie... They didn't even have a Batman animated movie at the time. No. And now we have, like, what, 30? Good. Endless. I'm, I'm, like, looking at my shelf <laughs> yeah. right now. There's Batman there's Ninja. Like 30. There's Batman by the Gaslight. That was, like, 1800 Batman. Yeah, Jack the it's Ripper. In, Jack the Ripper, yeah. Because uh, Eric Radomski and Bruce Tim, they were the directors of Mask of the Phantasm and the creative force behind um, the animated series, and they've gone on to basically do just animated films only. They've done a lot of work with Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, Superman, Justice League, and a couple of them have done work with Marvel, not so much, but when you ask any hardcore comic fan about who does animation better, it's DC that does it better. I really don't know how many Marvel animated movies that stand out to me. It's really only the DC properties that really come out for me. Because, honestly, like DC has... As crazy as this can sound, I think DC has the better stories. Like they may have that. really cool characters over in Marvel, like but you've got like your comparable like Iron Man to Batman, like shit like that. But I'm like if you look at it, like DC's more based in a reality thing. Like yes, you've got a man who's dressed like a bat who knows how to kick your ass. He's rich, cool. He can pay for all this shit. D a uh, Marvel, you got characters who are based in fantasy where you've they got they're mutated, they're 
all crazy and fucking shit. You got a guy who can have claws coming out of his arm. He could heal. But it's like there's a fantasy and a reality-based thing. Even with mm. DC doing aliens, like... Green Lantern. Uh, Green Lantern, uh, Martian Manhunter, Superman, they still try to base him in somewhat of reality. Like, where Martian Manhunter, dude, a pack of matches can take him out. Where Superman, it's actually a rock that can be fabricated here on Earth. Yeah. It's like there are things that can take them out in a reality-based thing. Mm. Where Marvel, you got to make up shit just to fucking do it? <laughs> Come on, man. Fantasy. Adamantium's not real? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Listen, I'm not sitting over here screaming out vibranium, all right? I'm screaming out motherfucking Batman. <laughs> vibranium. What can it do? Everything. I'm going to throw Anything. it, and it's going to be a Frisbee, and it's coming back to me, all right? <laughs> Actually, rewatching this movie again last night, the one thing that really stands out to me is the musical score. That is, like, another key staple to what makes this movie great instead of just being good, is the musical score, how it elevates everything. I'm going to say this right off the bat before we get into the synopsis, is this movie is damn near flawless. Oh, I, I can it's, agree. Like, And it's only 77 minutes. Yes, it's tight. This movie has no pacing issues whatsoever. It's one thing after another. There's action, there's horror, there's suspense, there's mystery. There's curves throughout the whole thing. Romance. And there's also an, an origin to Batman. This was actually, like, originally Batman Begins before Batman Begins was. This is true. And we didn't have to see the parents getting shot down either. Thank God, because we've seen enough of that. <laughs> Listen, that's all we know is fucking Batman's parents get shot. All right, that's it. Yeah. That's Everyone who does not know Batman... They should know this, all right? Listen, Batman's parents get shot. That's how he becomes Batman. Nobody cares after a while. Fucking be- let Batman be Batman. That was the best thing about Batman versus Superman. They didn't fucking tell us that Batman's parents got shot. We knew it. <laughs> ben Affleck came in, kicked some fucking ass, and he was here. He did. That's all we wanted. Yep. All right? Bat Flick should still be fucking Batman, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see him back in more Batman stuff. I mean, Berserker Batman, that was like the best part of that movie, Batman v Superman, when he beat the shit out of those guys. <laughs> best rock- three minutes of action. He rock bottomed a dude. He did. <laughs> he did. He threw a wooden crate at a guy's face. I'm pretty sure he died after that. I, dude, that whole fucking scene in the warehouse, they're shooting in there, he's smashing people with... They were dead, all right? I don't care who you are. Yeah. This is the best part died. of that movie. And they died, all right? <laughs> he was getting stabbed, he got shot at in the helmet, and this. Bulletproof helmet. <laughs> that was the way a Batman movie should be. Is oh. that warehouse scene alone? Yeah. That that should have been a solo Batman movie. All right, all right. we're yes. getting off the topic. Yeah, we're, no, we're, we're excited. We we're excited. We're Sorry, excited. we're nerds. And, you yeah. guys all know we're nerds. Speaking of action sequences, this animated movie has great action sequences. Very. It's intense. Not just the cops shooting at Batman because you know they think he's the phantasm because all these mysterious deaths are happening but also him just taking out like five people with a batarang cutting the guns in half and then basically booting a guy against the wall even when he's not as Batman as Bruce Wayne he sees somebody doing something wrong he wants to do something about it and he'll he'll beat him up <laughs> violence that you didn't see in the show were in the movie and some that was actually funny but yet you could totally see him doing like at the very beginning he flips a table on a guy and you see him struggling to get the gun and it's just his hand and you hear him, uh, uh, and Batman just walks by and you don't see the whole image of him. He's just kind of cut by the torso. And as he's walking by, he just steps on the table, that was great. flattening the guy and he's passed out. And That's you're great. like, damn, dude, this That's... is totally Batman. So he's <laughs> passed out. I'm like, air quotes <laughs> passed out. All right. <laughs> did you think of Die Hard when the guy was shooting at Batman through the table? I kind of did. You a know bit. what? <laughs> I thought about We got that. another Die Hard correlation. <laughs> shooting at Batman through the table. You are done. No more table. <laughs> Which is funny because this movie was inspired by Citizen Kane and Alfred Hitchcock, and I see it. Because they have those Citizen Kane flashbacks. Hell, they even have that image where Bruce is looking at the portrait of his parents by the fireplace, yes. like in Citizen Kane. Mm-hmm. And it goes back to the the past leading up to him becoming Batman to the current time frame. And then the guy, uh, Radomsky and Bruce Timm had said, well, what would Alfred Hitchcock do 
in the like the next sequence and the mystery and the suspense part and i was like wow that was a really great combo because i'm gonna say that maybe it's due to the fact that it's animation but there has always been a strong argument that this could easily be the greatest batman movie ever made yeah Oh, I can believe it. I can believe it because this animated movie did did things that some live action movies have failed to do. It's probably the most true Batman movie, at least at that time, that we ever mm-hmm. had. This was the early 90s we're talking about, but yeah. still, yes. It's said 93, so yeah, so really early 90s. And if you go on YouTube or find any review online, everybody makes the argument and says... How comes we don't know about this movie? It took so long for it to come out on Blu-ray. 24 years. And really? 24 years. It came out, what? So 93. Well, no, 93, so 2000... Wow, I can't do math right now. <laughs> so yeah, like a couple of years ago. This movie came out on Christmas Day of 1993. And I can actually say, because this movie bombed, it had absolutely no marketing. Mm-hmm. It was in and out of the theater. But I can actually be proud to say that I had seen this movie in the theaters as a kid. I remember it was my dad, my brother, myself. And a funny story is my sister joined us because she got into a fight with my mom. And she said, where are you guys going? We're going to the movies. Okay, I'm coming with you. So so my sister Farrell came with us and saw the movie. And even years later... I would bring this movie up because I thought it was great even then as a kid. And my dad thought the same thing as well. And I remember telling Farrell about it and she said, oh, is that the one where they go to the fair? Because there is this like fairground scene. And I was like, yeah, you remember it. She goes, yeah, that was really good. I like that one. There's a good compelling story. We're going to discuss this movie and we're going to let you guys know there is a major spoiler in this. So if you're enjoying what you hear, and you want to watch the movie, we'll give you a heads up as to when we're going to make the big reveal. But let's get into Batman, Mask of the Phantasm. This movie was based off of two graphic novels. One they ended up already doing again, which was Batman Year One, which you get your whole bringing up Batman, becoming Batman. And then they did Batman Year Two, where they used a Reaper villain to make up the Phantasm. Right. Now, there is some story to this. That when they created the Phantasm, because this Phantasm is supposed to be an original character, Bruce Tim was the one who said he was informed to make him look like the ghost of Christmas future. They even reference that in the, in the movie. Yes, they do. And he had a couple different drawings and he came up with this Grim Reaper metal skull with a axe on the hand kind of thing. And in almost every interview he says that that was pretty much the inspiration to make this. But the Reaper does have similar correlations to what this Phantasm is from year two, from the way he looks and the backstory. But that goes in with the spoilers, and we'll save that for the end if we remember. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was trying to I was just trying to give a gist. Yeah. I didn't want to. So, spoilers ahead. Spoilers ahead. But there's a really shitty deal that's going on. Batman spoils the party, and then he basically crashes in and has that awesome action sequence with the table, kicking the guy. And the Phantasm is introduced not too long after that. In fact, this was something that I kept going back and forth with how this Phantasm was able to repel bullets off of them, whether it was actually wearing a bulletproof vest, because there are people shooting at this character, and he's not phased by anything. He's surrounded by mist. You're wondering how this mist is being created. That's how I was wondering. Um, was it was it something supernatural? Was this actually a supernatural character, or was this somebody in a disguise? I had no idea. So there's mist created, and then there's bolts flying off of him, not being phased by it. So it just adds more to the mystery in terms of Batman's got a mystery to solve, and I think it leads to the death of one character, one of the mobsters, and then Batman's trying to go after the who the phantasm is we don't even know it's the phantasm in fact it's never called the phantasm once in the movie they just call it uh i don't even know what they call him they don't call it anything yeah it's nothing (laughs) there's a mob boss at the beginning his name's chucky saul and he runs away from the fight that batman 
uh, has started and is trying to take down. Gets into a parking garage, and this phantasm calls out Chucky Saul by his name, and he's got this very low, deep, eerie-sounding voice. Like we said, looking like the Grim Reaper. You don't even see his face yet. He's just kind of in the shadows, surrounded by all this smoke. So doesn't the phantasm actually refer to himself as the Angel of Death? Yes. The, the The main line that he says to all his victims is, Your Angel of Death awaits. And he, the phantasm gets shot at. <coughs> Chucky Saul unloads his whole clip. Nothing has phased him. Yep. So he tries to run away, gets in his car. Phantasm jumps on the car, still tries to attack him. And... An incident happens where Chucky Saul winds up careening out of the parking garage from the top level, crashes into another building, Mm -hmm. and he dies. But the people look up after they see this accident, and Batman goes to where the car had broken off from the garage, and they see Batman standing up there. Mm -hmm. So automatically, they think Batman had something to do with this car going out of the garage. Meanwhile, Batman finds a piece of broken glass with some funny residue on it, and he sees the phantasm silhouette in the background. And he tries to chase him down, and just like that, phantasm disappears. Then we cut to Arthur Reeves. (laughs) Booby. Big dick in the the movie. (laughs) Die hard. Ellis, the... Coke snorting Alice. <laughs> he believes that this was nothing but Batman and says, This is time that this vigilante has to come to justice. Mm-hmm. Commissioner Gordon's standing by his side and he's saying, I don't believe this. Batman doesn't kill. You're wrong. Now we got Phantasm and now we got Arthur Reeves. So we got a vigilante, if you want to call Phantasm a vigilante. Yeah. And politics now playing a part in trying to stop batman Mm -hmm. so you got not just the crime but another adversary and politics all coming down on batman i will use it mention commissioner gordon i wish he was involved more in this movie he's really only involved in that one scene he's never really brought into the rest of the show of the movie which i was kind of surprised me I, i was expecting to see more of him yeah he's only in the film twice so yeah that's it and being a big part in the show, you would think that... And been, Barbara Gordon right by his side, too. Yeah, that they would have him in there a lot more, but I guess because they're basing it more like, well, we're going to follow Arthur, Batman, Phantasm, and do their story. Gordon's not really part of this story, so probably mm-hmm. that's what was happening. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, like, even after that scene where you see Arthur talking to Gordon, Gordon just pieces out, they go outside, Batman's listening to this whole conversation. But he's working. Yeah. He, he's doing nothing but working. You know, there's you really don't see time off from him in the movie. I mean, you get that little party scene where, and that party scene's probably the only time where you see Bruce Wayne pretending to be the Bruce right, Wayne. Right, with all that, the girls surrounding him, yeah. the one girl throws the drink in his face, and he, <laughs> he actually walks off to go look at a portrait of his parents, and that brings us to one of the flashbacks. Mm-hmm. Because Arthur brings up um, Andrea Beaumont because she's coming back in the town and Andrea winds up becoming this love interest that he had. I'm assuming it's around the time he came back from his training, but she does say that she has seen him around campus, meaning that they've been to college together. Okay. But him and Andrea actually met in a cemetery. He was laying flowers down at his parents' funeral, uh, sorry, his parents' grave, Mm -hmm. and she's talking to her mother at her grave site. And it's just them two, and they start talking, they leave, and they actually get a connection. And you feel it from them. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel it from their voices and even the animation. It's it's very well done. They have similar traits. They both talk to their parents, even though they're both, they're deceased. They talk to them as if they're having a conversation with them right now because they even, she even says... I kind of act like I know what my mom's going to say when I have a conversation with her, even though I know she's dead. And they both have that same thing. So it has like one little interest that they have together. Following that scene, we get probably the biggest Batman Begins type scene then where he puts on a a ski mask. He has kind of a utility belt. He's got some like those metal balls with spikes, maybe ninja stars. Mm -hmm. he sees a robbery going down and he's 
telling the guys, you know, lay down, this is over, this is done, and they just laugh at him. <laughs> Let's get the guns out, boys. <laughs> he he winds up kicking their ass. He actually saves the day, but he realizes that he's got to put fear into these guys. And he's practicing, and the next morning, he's all bandaged up, and he's talking to Alfred, saying, i got to find a way to put fear in them from the start. Andrea comes back, and she's actually making funny jokes to him, saying, like, hey, you know, you didn't call me. I thought you might be dead or something. <laughs> you know, she does this throughout the whole movie. She's got sass. Mm -hmm. She's tough. Because you find out that she eventually uh, takes Bruce and flips him over. She does a jujitsu move on him. <laughs> Um, no, it's a Miss Huvier self-defense class for girls. Oh <laughs> he was doing jujitsu, and she goes, Kazentite. The, the funny thing is about that whole situation, he really wasn't doing jujitsu in real life. She did jujitsu to him, he was and he was doing Taekwondo. Taekwondo, but like, that's what he was doing, yeah. <laughs> they have that intimate moment together. Alfred walks in on them like, oh, nope, turn yep, it around. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Master Wayne. <laughs> And then we cut back to present time, and we see the next mob boss going to Chucky Saul's grave. He lay, uh, Buzz, Buzz Bronski. Buzz Bronski, yep. He lays down a, a wreath. He says, you know, Chucky, you are always a loser. And then you hear that dark voice from the phantasm. Mm -hmm. And again, he says, Buzz, your angel of death awaits chases him down throughout the whole cemetery buzz tries to make an attack like he takes a pickaxe tries to swing it at phantasm but that axe handle blade that the phantasm has on his hand cuts through it you see the uh, head of the pickaxe go flying off now he's got the sharp end of the stick and the phantasm like almost gliding towards him it's really creepy and scary and Buzz says, all right, you catch this. He throws the pointed end of the staff then towards the phantasm. He raises his hands, smoke just engulfs him, and you hear this sound, and it looks like the staff just went right through the phantasm. That was so cool to see the first time you watched that. And you hear Buzz go, what the? The mist and, just dissipates, and he's gone. Oh, so it cool. It was so cool. So Buzz is running away scared. He falls into an empty grave. Phantasm goes over the grave and <laughs> kind of reiterates what he said to Chucky Saul. Mm. You know, you always were a loser, Mr. Bronski. Yeah. And he's trying to climb up out of the grave, but he's six feet under and he can't do it. And he goes, farewell, Mr. Bronski. And once he thinks he's okay, he's safe. All of a sudden, that smoke that surrounds the Phantasm starts lifting up this angel monument tombstone angel of death <laughs> and it falls right on buzz in the grave and the next thing you see is buzz's two henchmen mm -hmm. go run into the grave and the statue is just all down in there and they know he's crushed he's dead and they see the phantasm's cape blowing in the wind and they think it's batman because phantasm has these like shredded shards of tips at the end and with him having a hood over, the cape flying, they think it's Batman. So now word's going around that Batman has killed two mob bosses now. And one of the elderly mob bosses, Sal Valestra, who has seen his better days. He's getting scared. He's totally, I don't want to say immobile, but he's on oxygen. He's his, got health issues. His health is yeah. like severely declined. He's very elderly, but he still values his life. Yeah. So he's scared now. He's nervous. Arthur Reeves is pissed off. He wants Batman in the worst way. Gordon still says, I don't want anything to do with this. Arthur convinces Harvey Bullock, the detective, to turn on the bat signal and try to lure him in, set him up for a trap. But here we find out Batman was standing outside Gordon's window on the ledge. Totally ignores it. Goes to the grave site. And he notices the same sort of residue that he found on the glass that I guess comes from the smoke. That was never... It's, it's got to be something from the smoke. <laughs> they never explained it. They it just it said the, it's this rare residue. He took it to the Batcave to analyze it and it was giving some sort of data. And he was still trying to figure that out. But yeah, you're right. You don't really know a whole lot about it. 
Then he goes to his parents' grave. And while there, he hears a voice. Here it's Andrea again. She's at her mother's tombstone. And it looks like she's cleaning it up, like, like getting grass trimmings that look like maybe the caretaker didn't quite get. Almost like she's weeding the area, like yeah. make it look right. really good. Exactly. Right. She turns around, sees Batman. He runs away. She does like a quick little dart to just like get closer to him, try to talk to him. But then she turns to the grave and sees it's Bruce's mom and dad. And just yeah, like she that, that, she makes that comment and goes, Bruce? Makes that connection. Wait, wait, it's that easy to figure out that he's fucking Batman? I'm just saying. Oh no, he was I standing mean, here at a grave. Height, voice. <laughs> <laughs> the Wayne grave. <laughs> I mean, Wayne's a pretty big name. I mean, it's the, pretty, it's the biggest name in Gotham, so. <laughs> and that particular grave that Batman would be at? <laughs> Didn't the Phantasm, Phantasm kind of remind you a little bit of Shredder? In a way. With, with the weapon that he had on his hand and the way the mask sort of is. I don't know. For some reason, I'll, I couldn't think of Shredder a little the bit. The lower? I could see that, yeah. Yeah. I could the lower see portion. I could see it, but no, it didn't really... It, I always thought of a Grim Reaper more than anything. Mm-hmm. But, well, definitely no, not, not in the color scheme. Yeah, it's yeah. Grim Reaper, obviously. But uh, even the weapon that he has, it kind of reminded me of like Shredder's claw a little bit in some way. <laughs> but I can, I can see what you're talking about yeah. there. So after the graveyard scene, we find Arthur and... Uh, Andrea, I wanted to say Dana. The actress who does her voice is Dana Delaney. Yeah, talented actress. She goes on to become Lois Lane because of this movie. Yeah. In the Superman animated series. Batman follows her and Arthur at a dinner meeting, and he's seeing them through binoculars. And there's like a really great animation shot where it's raining, and you see the rain just dripping on him. Yeah. That was really cool. I mean, they, they got the art in this movie beautifully. There's one scene in particular where he's as Bruce Wayne and then it's raining and the rain is just dripping on his face and he's like begging for his parents' help. And that's he's co- begging for their help. He's like, I don't know what to do. Can you please help me? I'm sorry, I can't live up to my expectations that you want me to be. And that's coming up. As he's seeing uh, Andrea and Arthur at the dinner table, he's remembering a time that him and Andrea went to the fairgrounds where they saw the future of Gotham City where he actually sees a prototype Batmobile. And she makes the comment, do you think we'll ever see anything like this in the future? And they go on this little roller coaster ride, and they show what houses, microwaves, ovens, all this stuff will future look like. Future world, yeah. <laughs> they get something like that. And she said, would you like to meet my dad? So she go, they go to meet her dad, who's voiced by Stacy Keach. And his... Say, if you don't know who he is, dude, just look up Cheech and Chong. He's the one cop. <laughs> That's all I can think of every it, time I heard the voice. Every time, I, every time I think of that name, I just think of his character, Cameron Alexander from American History X, where he was the neo-Nazi I was thinking leader. of that or uh, Christopher Titus's dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a good, he's a great actor, great stage actor. He's done a lot. He's done it all. <laughs> Very, like, standout voice, so. He's got one of those voices that's just so distinct. You know who it is. Bruce and Andrea meet her dad, and everything's going great. They even meet a young Arthur. He's an intern or an assistant for uh, Andrea's dad's name's Carl Beaumont. And a young Sal Valestra winds up coming in. And now things are starting to click a little more. We're starting to see that these mob guys have something to do with Andrea's father. And he's not happy that Sal showed up. And as soon as they leave... Bruce is already getting a bad vibe of, like, something's not right with this picture. Mm -hmm. And then in the distance, he sees a motorcycle gang ready to rob, like, what, a street peddler? Or I don't know what you you call him exactly. I think a street peddler would be a good way to put it. But Bruce says, I'm going to go try to stop this, and Andrea doesn't want him to do it. But he goes, he lays an ass kicking, but in the end, he ultimately fails. They're not afraid of him. They gang up on him. He gets knocked down. She gets worried. She doesn't want him to do anything like that anymore. And he's more pissed off that he failed. He even says, you know, Andrea, please. Like, I don't want you to nurse me. I don't want to hear it. I just want to be left alone now. Cut to him in the house. Let's say this. Would you be really scared of a rich boy running at you? 
I'm just saying, you're a gang of motorcycle guys. You see the richest motherfucker in Gotham come running at you like, Stop that! Ah! No, fuck that. <laughs> He comes at him like fucking Lawrence Taylor in the Super Bowl, man. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. Oh, he's, he's a rich boy. A spear to the first guy. Well, that's what I'm saying. If you think about it, that's what they're seeing. Like we're seeing it from Bruce Wayne's point of view, badass this and that. But you look at their point of view. This rich motherfuckers coming running at me like that. I don't care who you are. There's four of us in one. Yeah, year, that, yeah, that's what their concept was. I'm like, that's why I'm like they weren't afraid of him. Mm-hmm. And we cut to the next scene where he's at Wayne Manor trying to draw up a costume sketches yep and he's failing at it he says i don't know i don't even know why i'm bothered doing this alfred actually answers the phone and he says miss beaumont's on the line would you like to talk to her and there's this slight pause like he doesn't know what to do mm-hmm. you know because he's conflicted it's like wait a minute he has this urgency to stop crime yet because he's still feeling the scars from his parents dying but yet you can tell he's really liking this relationship thing. He's conflicted. But he says, I can't, it's got to be one or the other. I can't have it both ways. And then Alfred says, well, what do you want me to say? And he gets mad. He goes, I just don't know. And he punches the wall. He leaves. And that's when he goes to his mom and dad's gravesite again. Mm-hmm. And it's raining. And he says, can I just give money to the cops? You know, I wasn't expecting on being happy. It's a really powerful scene. Yeah, and it really makes you feel for him because it's like, well, yeah, nobody really wants to put their life on the line for this kind of stuff. It's, it's dangerous. dangerous. Yeah. You know, and he has the resources to actually create new technology to help the police force out. But I think it's just that in the end, he knows that the law can only do so much. And, you know, the law didn't help. They weren't there to help his parents out. And he saw it all, but then Andrea comes in the rain at his grave because he says, please tell me it's okay. And then Andrea shows up and says, maybe they already have, and that's why they sent me. Yeah. I mean, wow, dude. That's great. Wow. I think right before that scene, there's a shot where Bruce, um, the animation has the outside building, and then there's the two windows. For a brief second, it looked like a bat flew by. And he looked out the window and was like, what was that? Like something caught his attention, but only for a split second. Because you just saw like this brown object fly off the side. It's so quick, you'll miss it. But it looked like it was in the image of a bat. Where he started to get some idea, but he wasn't really sure what he was looking at. And then it led into the phone call and then to the grave site. But I'd never picked up on that before until now. There's just this brief little shot outside the window where there, a bat may have flown by, and maybe that kind of gave him a little idea of what he can go with in terms of his outfit, in terms of that image to scare people. It's also a little bit of a foreshadowing. Like, yeah. I think it's part of actually year one where the bat actually flies through the window, and that's where he gets the idea. Yeah. Where this story is more based on a love story, mm-hmm. where they wanted it to be this is what could have happened if Bruce would have found the right person, instead of it just being, well... I'm Batman, motherfucker. But (laughs) I actually enjoyed that a little bit more about this movie. They wanted it to be a love story. They didn't want it just to be another Batman movie. They didn't want it another action movie. It was, well... It had substance. Yeah. Yeah. It gives it more depth. Yeah, could actually fall in love with people. He's not this heartless fuck who goes around beating people with a mask on. And you feel it. You really feel it. You know, you don't get the sense of, like, him with Talia and Selena Kyle... This is genuine love that he feels. And they draw Andrea is this beautiful girl, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's got these gorgeous eyes and, like, great personality that is a yang-yang effect, you know, yeah. where Bruce, he's not the, like, tight, tight-nipped tight you know, rich boy. Right. You know, she's not afraid to be sassy, and she's tough, man. She's not a damsel in distress. She's a great character. She's a female version of himself. After the graveyard scene, we get the sense that everything's okay. We cut back to him following Andrea <laughs> to her um, apartment then. But before before that, we find out that um, uh, Arthur Reeves meets up with Sal Valestra mm-hmm. because he says that he wants to know, is the Batman really knocking off these old guys that I used to work with? And Arthur's like, well, we don't really have proof, but we're pretty sure it's him. And he's like, well, I need more protection. And 
Arthur doesn't want anything to do with it. He tells him, you know, you're on your own with that. So Sal goes to that old fairgrounds where um, Andrea and Bruce were in the past Mm -hmm. to go search for help. And who does he find? None other than the Joker. Which is kind of funny because the Joker is numero uno in Batman villains. And he's kind of built like a side character. He is a side character in this movie. Absolutely. Just comes down that hallway. The robots explode. Like you see like this big number that possibly happened. And all of a sudden just everything just gets ruined and wrecked. Because the Joker planned it that way. Taking him through the ride again. And everything is really decrepit and old. And moss is growing on the on the robots. <laughs> Actually the reason they Joker was the side character. They didn't want this movie to be like it was part of the anime series but they wanted to be its own thing so like he didn't play a pivotal role he was there but they wanted to bring in new a new villain too but mm-hmm. if they already had the base work for the anime series and using the joker obviously biggest villain out there for batman they rather would have a new villain and joker is a side character they wanted they didn't want the original rogues gallery from the anime series they wanted more based on new character and Bruce's love story. But the funny thing you brought up about the robots when he shoots them, the noise they use is actually the same one of the Millennium Falcon yes, powering down yes, from is. Empire Strikes Back. Ah! Yes, it is. It's a little bit of an Easter egg. I was like, I was waiting. I heard that. I'm like, yes, I'm going to throw this in here now. <laughs> and who'd better to do it than the man who played Luke Skywalker himself? Mark Hamill, man. And then and there's even like a moment, a really cool like savage moment where Salvatore like puts his hands on Joker and you know he doesn't like that. He like he starts to get like his grit, he's biting his teeth. He wants to like do something to him so bad right now, but then he just pushes it off and goes <laughs> with his whole big charade and his big lavish extravaganza that he's got basically installed for Batman. And he just gives Salvatore that big grin, like he's gonna do something to him. Well, really he, bad. When Sal grabs him, he goes, "Don't touch me, old man. Yeah. I don't know where you've been." Yeah. He and, brushes it off. He and then he says, "Yeah, of course I'm gonna help you out." And Sal's like, "Oh, really?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'm gonna get you." And Sal perks this little smile and he goes, "That's what I want to see." And he gives this really sarcastic, a nice big smile. smile. And then that's it. You cut then to Andrea back in her apartment. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arthur tries to make moves to stay with her, and she says, no, you're gone. Mm -hmm. Batman's already in the room. Yeah, I think she she knew that. And she knows it, which is even great. It's like, damn, man, you're wondering, is she this great detective too? Or do her and Bruce just have this thing where they just get each other? They got a connection. And she walks over to him, turns on the light, and just gives a little, hmm. This motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> and, and again, she says to him another smart-ass quip. Hmm. So we meet again. I like the cape, but I'm not too sure about the mask. And then here he winds up holding out a picture to her. Here he found a picture of all the mob bosses that are dying, along with Sal. Another guy who we don't really know yet. Mm-hmm. And her father. And he says, have you ever seen this picture? And, of course, she denies it. And he goes, well, your father's in this. What, is, what was he doing with all these guys? And she goes, I don't know. Well, where's he at now? She tells him, try Madagascar. I don't know. And then he says, that's not what you told Arthur. You told him you were closer than ever to him. And she's like, what, are you bugging me? And he says, no, I can just read lips. And she goes, well, read them now. Get out. <laughs> and then Some good writing in this. <laughs> and then here was another really good line. As he's getting ready to leave, he says, do you still follow your father's orders? She goes, the only person I see in this room that's controlled by his parents is you. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> well, was just the like, writing is just so oh, great in this like movie. The ref takes a point away. Like, <laughs> damn. <laughs> Jeez, damn. Just that jab right there in the gut. <laughs> After he leaves, she makes a drink for herself. But she drops in. She starts having a breakdown. Mm -hmm. And then we cut to the Phantasm getting ready to enter Sal Valestra's house. Phantasm walks over to Sal Valestra. He's got a newspaper up this time. But he's sitting in the chair with his oxygen tank close by. Phantasm says his line about the angel of death. (coughs) Rips the newspaper away. 
Here Sal Valestra's dead. Joker got him with the toxin. He's got this big grin on his face, and there's a little camera on his lap. Points towards the phantasm, and Joker's like, whoops. <laughs> well, guess joke's on me. You're not Batman after all. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Probably like a really good sequence too, because like the whole situation happening, and then Joker be like, "Oh fuck, man! Like, oh, you're not bad, man." <laughs> Even he was shocked. Yeah, he was. And Phantasm gets this vibe that something's not right, because Joker's just going on and on about stupid shit, and he bolts out of the room, and the room explodes. And the next thing you see is this really cool shot of the Phantasm climbing up this ladder on the one edge of the building. He turns around and they zoom in on the house being on fire. And here comes Batman in the bat plane. And he's chasing Phantasm down as Phantasm creates some smoke and is just booking it on these rooftops, jumping over each building top like Brandon Lee and the Crow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and Batman puts the bat plane on auto, jumps out, tackles Phantasm, and Phantasm even says, this is not your fight. Just stay away. And Batman tells him, no, this madness ends now. This is all going to stop. Actually, I got a quick question. Do you think Batman's more mad that the Phantasm's pulling his own shit on him? Because, like, come on, all the Ooh. smoke and everything, and be like... <laughs> Yeah, this motherfucker just goes to me how many times yeah, now? Right. And I go, I wonder if Gordon feels like this every time I do this. <laughs> I'm like, I gotta stop. There's gonna be one person like this. Is that what it, that's not what it feels like. <laughs> and the Phantasm's really not setting Batman up. It's no. just a bad coincidence yeah. that this is all happening. It's like the wrong place, the wrong time. Like, oh yeah, the car jumped off. Batman just happens to be like, what the fuck it? Oh, oh, oh! Yeah, yeah. yeah the silhouette. Oh, it's Batman. And this yeah. whole time I'm led to believe that Phantasm is this supernatural being, but then when Batman tackles him, you know it's clearly a human somebody's clearly in the mask and the cape so it's somebody not who they say they are it's not something that's elemental and the way the phantasm is running over the rooftop to another it seems like there's something in the foot in the footwork every time they make a step there's smoke and fog that comes out from the footsteps so maybe there's something built into the shoes maybe or like behind the boots that they're creating this effect Listen, I'm going to start buying these shoes so I can get out of conversations. Yeah, right. <laughs> Listen, I'll you see smoke them. I'm out. Because <laughs> I feel it'd be easier to get out of a conversation, either do a whole bunch of bats and just run or just the smoke and just kind of waltz right out. Because I'm not running. I'm telling you now. <laughs> you find those shoes, you let me know. Oh, I will. Seriously. You're just going to see smoke and all appear and then smoke and I'm gone. That's it. That's how it's going to work from here on out. As Batman is confronting Phantasm, the police show up in a helicopter Phantasm gives Batman an elbow, creates the smoke, disappears. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just up. He runs into the smoke, gone. See? Perfect. Smoke <laughs> out. <laughs> Where'd you get your smoke bombs? <laughs> and then the helicopter propellers are actually what blow the smoke away. Mm -hmm. And they see Batman again, and they think it's him. They, he's, and another nice thing about this is he looks and he sees the cops are already trying to break into the bat plane. So he tries to escape on foot, which leads to this huge police chase, which was epic for it's a cartoon. It's really epic. Guns blazing. <laughs> and what, he's jumping from this building to that building, off a building. He's not even landing on his feet. He's taking hits. He's getting hurt. You actually see him limping at times. At one point, he falls off somewhere, and he's surrounded by 50 cops. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Jumps off another building, tries to hide in a construction site. They surround it. Now they're throwing smoke grenades, shooting at him still, flash grenades, all this stuff. One cop even just opens fire with an automatic, shoots an oxygen tank or gas tank, whatever, makes a huge explosion. Yeah. Now we see Batman at the most vulnerable that we've probably ever seen him. This is the lowest point, yeah. His his mask is ripped, his clothing is ripped, he's crawling, he's even looking, seeing the blood that he picked up from his head, he's got blood dripping from his lips. Well, he pulled off a really clever stunt. In order to evade the cops, he launched his mask and his cape with a sawhorse, making it look like he was flying towards the helicopter so they could shoot it to shreds, and they realized, oh shit, it's a dummy. Where is he? Where'd he go? And so basically as a distraction as he's going down this alleyway. And he's unmasked. Yeah, it's he's no, unmasked. There's no spare mask. 
he's he's hurt he's wounded they're still chasing him like at one point you see him just kind of fading and he's losing his eyesight he's probably got a concussion maybe loss of blood his ears are ringing i'm sure from the explosion luckily andrea shows up right place right time and she says, hurry up, get in. And they take off to Wayne Manor. How about that timing? He even says, you had excellent timing. And she said, I heard it all over the radio. Mm-hmm. Like the whole thing was nothing but Batman's being chased in this yeah. construction alley. And we don't know how far away her apartment is either. Now, there's something we, we, we uh, missed. Because there's something that happens in this Batman movie that has never been explored before in any other live action movie or animated movie. The fact that Bruce Wayne proposed... He proposed to Andrea and, you know, of course she accepts. And then there's a moment where he's looking at Batcave locations and she gives the ring back because she has another obligation and she can't really be with him at this time. And then it leads to that moment where he, I think it was when they're embracing during the engagement, the bats fly out from the ground yes, and that gives him more of the inspiration. It was a bat that I saw outside my window. I'm going to use that image to install fear on my enemies. And then he puts the cowl on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, hold on. Okay, I thought I would. No, you're right. All that correlates in that flashback. Mm -hmm. But after he proposed and the bats fly out of the cave, he goes checking it out. And then Alfred's waiting for him to come up when after he, like, I guess investigated it to see, like, what the cave was, Mm -hmm. how far down it went. If there's a bat problem. Oh, yeah, there's a bat problem. Rabies. A six-foot motherfucking bat. (laughs) And rabies. (laughs) And he sees Alfred just all depressed, and he asks him, what's wrong? And it's this basic note with the engagement ring, left with dad, too young, need time, forget about me. He crushes the note, and you hear Shirley Walker's music again. Fucking great music. You feel for Bruce, and then it slowly fades into the picture of his parents that's on the wall and then we go into the bat cave he's got a cape on you see him putting the utility belt on alfred's holding the mask and then he just he's just standing with his back towards alfred holds out his right hand alfred walks over gives him the mask stares at it and you hear the the batman theme that was inspired by danny elfman that Shirley Walker just kind of revamped for the animated series. As he puts it on and turns around, the trumpets and everything just gets so elevated. Alfred gets this look of fear and shock in his face, and all you see is black, and Batman's eyes just get to that that menacing, like, evil, scary. And you even see Alfred go, oh my God. God, you know, and you don't hear people in the kids' cartoons going like saying Lord's name in vain. Yeah. So, you know, we're getting violence. <laughs> it's a PG movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the like the, all that censorship that we said, they put it in there. And then we get back to Aunt Andrea is actually dressing Bruce's wounds, and he says, "Okay, you need to tell me the truth about your father." And she says, remember that one night we went to go see him, you dropped me off, and his guys were there. They were the mob. He embezzled their money. They wanted it back. They wanted it back ASAP, with interest. He ran away with Andrea. That's why she couldn't be with Bruce. Right. You forgot one thing. I'm I'm getting there. I'm I'm getting there. (laughs) You're reading his mind. I know, I'm like... (laughs) You're in his mind. Pivotal point. <laughs> when Bruce dropped Andrea off, there's this mystery guy that we see. Doesn't say anything, but he gives Andrea one of those. <laughs> and he even flicks an ash or a cigarette at Bruce's car when he takes off. Andrea says the mob wanted interest compounded in blood. My dad paid him back, but it wasn't enough. And the only way he could stop him was to kill him and bruce says so the man in your costume again not saying he's the phantasm that's your father and the phantasm is actually voiced by stacy keach it's a very deep voice man yeah, it is. It is. so mystery solved yeah 
they have they actually have an intimate scene they feel the happiness again because she's upset but this time he's tra- telling her it's okay and they go back to you know feeling love for each other again yeah. he's actually thinking of things changing again for the better for them and she even says i hope so but she goes off she probably wants her space yet probably still has her own thing to do and bruce said something's bothering me with this picture that he showed her that had all the mob guys and the mysterious figure that we just mentioned yeah and alfred's like well, what what do you think is wrong he takes out a a red colored pencil and you see him starting to draw and he goes oh no here the mystery figure is, is the, the joke. fucking joker man <laughs> the young version of the joker like holy mind shit mind blown mind blown he draws the smile and then you just hear the <laughs> we did not see that coming yeah actually if you look at it now yeah. yeah like even being a fan of the series you could see the way like the face was you mm-hmm. could see it, but he's wearing a hat, so it kind of, like, throws the whole... I mean, his off. face isn't white, you know. Yeah, but it, I mean, like, how the nose is, how, like, the way the it was drawn, like, you can get a concept of it. Mm-hmm. It's like, honestly, I didn't really, like, pick it out until re-watching the movie, because, mm-hmm. like, it's been forever. But uh, I was like, as I'm watching, I'm like, that's what I noticed. Like, I instantly, like, oh, shit, that, just the way he was drawn, too, was like, yo, that's who it is. But it's like, mm-hmm. not really seeing it for almost... 25 years <laughs> but because they never gave the joker an origin story in the animated series you didn't think right away oh this is gonna be the joker because you thought maybe sal was just going to him being because he even says to him you know batman better than anybody so here's what five hundred thousand dollars or whatever it was to Some, to kill yeah, him something like that yeah Honestly, the way we get introduced to Joker in the animated series is probably the funniest fucking thing ever. He's singing that Jingle Bells Batman Smell song. <laughs> episode he, two, yeah. Actually, it's episode one. Is episode one? No, Leather Wings was. Oh, that was Man one. Bat. That's yeah. Right. All I remember is him getting. Sh- he's shooting that fucking Christmas tree out the wi- out the top yeah. of the Arkham, and then that's it. That's how we get introduced to Joker, and that's what it is. There is no origin story. Yeah. After we discover that the Joker was part of the gang, we cut to uh, Arthur Reeves on the phone. He's pissed. He's so upset that the cops let Batman go. He said, you had like 50 guys and you let him get away. I cannot believe this. He hangs up the phone. And then we get this other epic intro of the Joker. Mm -hmm. Arthur Reeves is just like, oh man, this is unbelievable. Lightning and thunder go off. And he goes, tisk, tisk. And to think all our tax money goes to pay all those jerks. (laughs) (laughs) That kind of reminded me of Tim Burton's Batman. Well, Jack, yeah, Jack yeah. is dead, my friend. You can call me Joker. Well, even his his trench coat and the mm-hmm. that fedora with the flat top. Yeah, that's what Jack Nicholson wore. Mm-hmm. So that again, there was some Tim inspiration. Burton inspiration again. And of course, they have their talks, and Joker knows that Arthur was doing ties with that mob that Valestra had. Yeah, because he even says, "You knew about everything that was going on." You know, I want to know who's killing off everybody. That's why I came here. And he says, well, you know who it is. You read the papers. It's Batman. And he has this little buzzer on his hand. He goes, eh, wrong. It's not Batman. That was a great move. <laughs> he goes, I've seen the guy. He looks more like the ghost of Christmas future. Nowhere near as cute as Bat Boy. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, are they implying that Joker in is actually in love with Batman? <laughs> you know what? It's... <laughs> I mean, the Lego Batman did hint on that. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> it was so hilarious. In, in a latent way, yeah. It really is. Because, honestly, Batman and Joker are yin and yang. Like, mm-hmm. they, they can't are. have one without the other. But it's like, hey, if he's in love with Batman, whatever, man. That's why he's the best villain of all time. <laughs> Any villain, really. There's always going to be some kind of obsession, whether it's for a love or hate. It's a desire. So there is, as screwed up as it sounds, yeah, there is a love to it. Actually, yeah. Like, I think there is a storyline where Batman stops being Batman, Joker just gets normal. Mm-hmm. He actually hides under the moniker Joe Kerr. Ah, uh, uh, lazy uh, writing. Ah, uh, uh, lazy writing, yeah. <laughs> but it's kind of funny that Joker just goes normal. Like, Batman's not here. I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. It's not fun anymore. I won't kill you because you're just too much fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, they're destined to do it forever. Don't bring that up. It's sad. <laughs> it is. And then we got a shitty Joker there for 
for a while. Anyway, stop. Back to- no, stop, <laughs> stop, stop. Just, okay, that, that, that's where we draw the line. Well, anyway, now Arthur, <laughs> apparently, uh, I guess Joker infused his gas on Arthur because now he starts losing well, his well, mind. Before, before that, I forget exactly how the line was, but he talks about you implied that you, know, you let us know where Carl is, you know, for your own selfish schemes. And he's like, wait, are you saying that I have something to do with this? You hear the phone rings, and here it's Andrea. And he, Joker makes Arthur answer it. And she just says, like, hey, sorry, I can't meet tonight. I just wanted to let you know. I got plans, but we'll do it some other time. And then Joker hangs up the phone, and he's like, well, no, ain't that a coinky dink? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we're talking about the old man and the spawn of his loins just happens to call makes you want to laugh doesn't it Artie? honestly the way mark hamill delivers oh, those dude, lines yeah. it's like it's too good honestly i'm just sitting here like listening to you guys talk about it. i'm like man i want to rewatch this movie yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna watch and, it again and, tonight <laughs> i dude i have been re-watching this movie since i got it on vhs i've had it on dvd now blu-ray even if it comes out on 4k i'm getting it this is a batman movie and a movie in general that i will add to my collection all the time so you're telling me you burn out the vhs like i burn out the vhs for a power rangers movie except i really like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> listen i did until i grew up you did, so you grew- <laughs> but with this movie you watch it as a kid and you grow up and you love it even more when we were talking about this movie and like really wanting to do it i wanted to show it to my daughter like this was like one of those things i'm like dude the animated series dude when they put on blu-ray i was excited 25th anniversary amazing i was like cool now i can actually show it to you yeah i showed her this movie she sat through it like honestly i was expecting like her to just get on board with it yo she sat there and i'm like she's sitting with me we're watching this and i was like it blew my mind like it holds up like the animation everything it holds up to the test of time like this movie's amazing and I'm like, I'm excited that it's still here. It, they're going to keep it around. It's not going to be like, well, after a while, we're just going to brush it under the carpet. Like, fuck off. <laughs> no, it's still here. They put it in the new box set, which pisses me off. Not the box set. The, well, yeah, the box set. Because you can't get it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there fighting with it to get it the fuck out. But that's not the problem. <laughs> it's an amazing movie. Eh? Yes, this movie is. We find out now Arthur is infused with the Joker gas. He's lying in a hospital bed. They can't control him. So he's basically on the verge of dying. They try to inject him, calm him down with whatever they they give him. Batman shows up. Batman's all serious. He's asking him questions. Why did the Joker meet with you? He knew you were part of the mob. What do you have to do with this? And he goes, oh, I don't know. And Batman just grabs him and pulls him in and says, that's not the answer I want. And then he actually sobers up. Yeah. And he's scared. And he said, well, I helped Carl and Andrea get out of town and we kept in touch. He goes, well, when was the last time you spoke to him? He said, years ago. And I asked him for help with my political campaign, but he said he didn't want to help me. And then Batman said, so, you sold him to the mob. And he's now he's like full-blown in the Joker yeah. gas. And he goes, I was broke and desperate and all they wanted was their money back. <laughs> and then Batman just leaves him. The like, sedation's worn off. Like, he's, and yeah. he, he's like, I'm not helping you. Bye. So he goes back to Andrea's apartment. I don't know why check on her or investigate or something oh he wanted more than just to check on her (laughs) (laughs) he finds a locket and here it was him and andrea from uh when they first met and were dating phone rings and he actually thinks should i answer this so he answers the phone here it's joker (laughs) and he says again mark hamill in the great writing well, hey, listen, Toots, even though you never call and never write, I still got a soft spot for you. <laughs> so I'm sending you a fun gift, airmail. And here he has this little airplane from that fair, and it has one of his Joker bombs. Batman sees it, throws a battering at it, blows up, throws him back against the wall of her apartment. Joker thinks it got her. And then here the bomb... Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, the phone's hanging around and you hear Joker going, <laughs> he's laughing, saying, hello, operator, I think my number's been disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> and then we cut to the fair. Now, 
here comes the major spoilers. If you love what we're hearing and you want to see this movie, and if you haven't seen it, stop listening now and just watch the movie. If you haven't seen this movie and you're a Batman fan, what are you doing? <laughs> just what are you doing? Go to the uh, hideout where Joker is. It's this futuristic living room place. He even has this robotic woman that's cutting stuff, and he has a piece of bologna, like a foot-long round bologna. <laughs> it's really big. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculously big. <laughs> and she's sitting there chopping away, and he's just like sliding this thing through like it's a meat fucking slicer. <laughs> And he finds out that the window's open and he even says, well, ain't it always the way? You get in the mood and company shows up. (laughs) (laughs) And then the phantasm again, Joker, your angel of death awaits. Joker says, I'm impressed, lady. You're harder to kill than a cockroach on steroids. (laughs) So you figured it out. Phantasm rips the cloak and mask off. Here it's Andrea. Yeah, that that was probably like one of the biggest reveals. That was a big twist. It, it's amazing. And it's a woman yet. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. I mean, that's like totally against film. Like, you know, women can't be like super violent. They can't be the hero. That's why it's so shocking. But yet, you know, like everything was kind of there when you look back on it. You know, she was tough. She was sassy. Listen, she, she put Batman on his ass, all right? Come she on. She did. She only got emotional once throughout the whole thing, so she's not afraid to get her hands bloody. You know, she presents herself very well, fitting in with an aristic crowd and stuff like that. Like, you don't expect it from her. You do sympathize with her because of what she's going through. Oh, yeah, she didn't ask for that life. No. I mean, who would want to have ties in with the mob and grow up with that? I mean, we all have our own struggles, whether it's, physical abuse or mental abuse you really do feel for her i mean even though there were resources there that her dad did to keep her happy Mm -hmm. she lost her mom so it was just her dad so who's there really to ground him no except his daughter but yet he had to take everything away because of his dumb stuff and (coughs) she's pissed off now joker's her last victim they get into a fight he winds up escaping. He puts on this huge fan <laughs> and it's getting ready to suck her in and make her mincemeat. Batman comes in on his motorcycle, jumps up and throws it into the fan to cut that's, the propeller blades. That was crazy. That entire <laughs> sequence. And it was and it was almost like, oh man, is he gonna save her in time? Yeah. Like, holy shit. But he does, and Joker's like, oh nuts. And then that's when Batman confronts Andrea, still partially dressed in the Phantasm oh, yeah, costume. Full black. And he says, Your father's dead, isn't he? And you came into town early to get Chucky Saul, and then you're going to blame it on your dad. And that's what your plan was. No shit, Sherlock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, They took everything from me. They took my dad, my life, you. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's the only way I know how, so you either help me or you get out of the way. And he says, what will vengeance solve? If anybody knows the answer to that, Bruce, it's you. And he actually gets taken back by it, and he says, please leave. And it's not like he's talking to Robin, like, get out of here. Right, I'm talking about a sidekick. (laughs) It's an emotional pull. It's, please, I still love you. Let me do this. You're going off the deep end. You want vengeance. I do justice. Right. That's the difference between the two of them. We find out she's become this dark side of what Batman could become. Except she only has a group of guys that she wants done. You know, she's not out to, like, rid every crime boss or kill. Like, as far as we know, she just wants to take these guys out who affected her personally. Which rightfully so, she deserves. She mm-hmm. deserves this vengeance, and mm-hmm. if she's done, she's done. And on top right. of that, we find out that when she discovered her dad died, it was Joker who killed it. She came back from the grocery store, because we see she's carrying bags of groceries. As she's getting ready to open the door, the knob twists and out walks Jack Napier, pre-Joker. And you hear her like yelling and screaming for her dad. And you hear her crying, and Joker just 
walks off. So she's really got it out for him, especially last. Joker lets Batman know now that he's still in the fair. Batman's chasing him down through these tunnels. It's like fake city. That's <laughs> He hides Joker hides in this like Chrysler building type mask. If you look closely, you can see the Warner Brothers logo on the one factory. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little bit of an Easter egg. I'm more laughing at the fact that this whole situation just screams old Japanese like monster movie because he had Joker dressed as a building. He's <laughs> fighting Batman. I'm like... He turns on the little city yeah. and the cars are hitting his feet. And yeah. he's like... It's and Godzilla and Kong fighting each other in the city. <laughs> even that Joker jingle from the animated series is playing. And Joker lays a hit on Batman at that Chrysler building top, mm-hmm. and it's got that sharp point to it. Yeah. Where once he's on the ground, he's ready to stab him, and Batman kicks Joker in the mouth, and you see a tooth fly, blood and teeth fly. I'm glad they they caught that animation detail where he's missing a tooth. That's good. Joker gets more of those little toys coming out. Those airplanes. They're flying by. They're cutting Batman up. They cut his arm. Blood's flying towards the screen. His suit's getting cut. He's having a hard time knocking him down. Hell, he punches one with the propellers cutting his hand and the blood's flying as he's punching and destroying the one in his hand. He sees the three more coming, takes his cape off. That was great. Like quick wraps him around and smashes him to the ground. But in that time, Joker has activated a bomb with like dynamite all underneath this fairground and he says in five minutes everything goes up so batman goes to chase him joker's got a jet pack on this time of course he does where does he get these wonderful toys (laughs) (laughs) and it looks like at one point joker's gonna escape but batman being batman which is the other thing that people don't understand you know how we have the separation between pro athletes and normal people Mm -hmm. like a a good day at a gym is a pro athlete's worst day at a gym if we think we did great they are far superior than what we've done Mm -hmm. that's what batman is not only is he very smart very intellectual inventive but he's a basically a pro athlete master martial artist he is like not just honed his his mind but his body as well. That's what makes him on a supernatural level. Like as far as his physical capabilities go. Yeah, he's not Superman, but compared to all of us, he's damn near a superhero. And he put his body through rigorous training to do that yet. And that's why we see him doing shit like jumping off of buildings, doing these incredible leaps to get Joker. And they have this epic fight where he's on the jet pack and they're flying. And Joker even has this line, like, if you don't let me go, we're both going to die. And Batman just says, whatever it takes. Pulls him down. They crash. They're both bloody battle damage mode. (laughs) Joker even says, for once, I'm stuck without a (laughs) punchline. And guess what? Andrea walks right up to Joker and he just goes, uh oh. <laughs> and he says, I give up. I surrendered already. Tell her, Batman. And he says, Andrea, you got to get out of here. The place is ready to explode. No, one way or another, it ends tonight. Everything's going off. She's holding Joker with her fists. And he gives that epic laugh. That's that laugh I wish I, I, wish I could see in that, the recording studio. That last laugh. And it's so cool. The bombs are going off. The music's playing. She's just staring as she's got a hold of him. Joker drops to his knees almost like, I know it's done, but I'm going out laughing because I'm Joker. She disappears in the smoke. They both do. And Batman goes over and he's screaming for her. Nothing happens. More explosions go off. He falls through to the sewer level. And he gets washed away to the shoe. Um... I guess it's a shore line. Either so. way, he gets yeah. washed away and he's safe. He's looking back at the explosions and realizes there's no way anybody could survive that. Yeah. He's back in the back cave. He's got his mask off. He's looking down and he says, I couldn't save her, Alfred. I don't think she wanted to be saved. And that vengeance blackens the soul and that he was always afraid Bruce was going to walk that fine line 
Because once you go past that and fall into that darkness of an abyss, you don't get out. And he said, not even you could ever bring her back. Yeah. And that, that plays with your heart, man. Like, here was a guy who's been mentally destroyed, knew that he was going to fight crime... Andrea comes in, wants a change in life, and realizes, hey, I can be normal, I can be married, I can have a family. But the same thing that happened to him as a kid happened to her, and it succumbed her. It's like, wow. It's powerful. He sees the locket in the distance where he sees a light, and it's almost like a glimmer of hope when he finds that locket inside the back cave, and he opens it up and realizes the two of them together. And then um, the next scene, we're looking at a ship. There's a party going on. And lo and behold, she's still alive. Someone else is trying to flirt with her. It's like she's starting over, starting a new life. She's all by herself off in the distance. And she's like, I don't want company. Please, you know, leave me alone. And the music, again, it plays this nice little, like, romantic, Mm -hmm. but yet somber. And the guy's actually not being... He's not being a dick. No, no. He's actually sincere when he says, I'm sorry, do you want to be left alone? And her response is, I am. And I think she feels like the way Bruce did now at the graveyard, where he's like, please, you know, tell me I can be different. Yeah. And she realizes that this is why he is who he is, because she it's almost like she gets it now. And she even she can't be with anybody else. Yeah. I almost got that vibe from Batman Returns when Bruce sees the cat in the limousine. Mm. Merry Christmas, Alfred. Like, almost like holding on to that cat is sort of like hope that maybe Selena Kyle is still alive. Maybe she isn't. They drive off, and then you just see Catwoman in the, in the background. Like, she's not dead. She's still alive. Just like Andrea. She's not dead. She's still alive. <laughs> and then we cut to Shirley Walker's music again. Away from the boat, back in Gotham City. And the music's building and building and building and you just see him standing on the ledge of a building batman i mean his head's down his eyes are closed the bat signal pops up he he opens his eyes he looks up the drums are kicking in the music's pacing faster and it's almost like he was still a little bit depressed but the signal awoken him again and then you hear that awesome sound when he opens the back cape it, it was so cool it's that whoosh yeah and then when he takes out his grappling hook and he shoots it it has this more epic sound to it mm-hmm. it's like a rejuvenation swings away the cape opens up and it's this epic close-up with the music building and building and building and it's back again at that's, another batman adventure that's great now this leads me this is my one issue that i didn't like about the movie and it's really, this is so nitpicky, but I'm going to say it right now. The end credit music is awful. It's like this smooth jazz music. It was like, it just didn't feel like Batman at all. I wish it just continued with the score that we've been getting, but it cuts to this jazzy, soft rock kind of music. I'm like, what is this? That was also sung by Tia Carrera. From Wayne's World. That's like the chick from Wayne's World? Yeah. Really? This, this felt like it didn't belong to me. I'm like, what am I listening? The movie's over, okay. But, what? I don't know. The movie's over. I'm like, uh, this. it's so nitpicky. I didn't care for the song choice in the credit scenes. I wish it was more of the orchestrated music that we got in the whole animated movie. Like I said, it's so nitpicky. But I was just distracted by this end credit music. I'm like, I don't like this. <laughs> I liked it. I, I actually know. enjoyed the song. Nothing against Tina Curry. I no, mean, she's it, a gorgeous actress, but this song did not belong to me in this end credit music. It, it didn't bother me, really. I, like I said, I enjoyed the song. It was, it, it is like like a romantic jazz yeah. type of... It just felt out of place to me. Yeah, really I mean, did. even the title of the song is called I Never Even Told You, which doesn't really have anything to do with the story of the movie. Well, other than she never told him that she's the fantastic. Yeah. She's the fantastic. Sorry, I didn't tell you it was a phantasm. Yeah. yeah. Using my dad's that, that, voice. Yeah, that's like just stretching it, though. Wait, does he have like a voice emulator, too, the whole like time? In, like in Scream, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Butcher. 
But I think Shirley Walker's music was a great ending to the movie. Like, you could watch that movie without watching the credits. Yeah, you can. Exactly. Right. You can. So that's why I think it doesn't bother me. It's like, okay, here's a credit song, big deal, whatever. For those brief couple seconds, it bothered me. I'm like, <laughs> this doesn't belong. Okay, I, I love the movie, but this is the end, so I can't really fault the movie because this is the very end. You know, honestly, with you, with that being said, I don't have a least favorite scene in this. It's, I don't have a least favorite either. I'd say, honestly, it's an extended episode, but just a lot more graphic than what the, well... Yeah, a lot more graphic than what the show was. There's really nothing you can complain about it. Like you said, you had a nitpick just to even, like, kind of half-ass that, John. Come on. <laughs> the end credit music. Yeah. <laughs> like, the song choice at the very end. But what would your favorite scene be? Well, I, I, I would say if I had to nitpick something myself, I'd probably want to see more of the Phantasm, just because I really love that character. I thought there was a great original character that they came up with. And also, going back to that year two stuff about the Reaper. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. The Reaper was based off of a character is basically the opposite of Phantasm. It was actually the father, and there was of a girl named Rachel, and Batman loved Rachel. And so that's why when I hear like the director say, no, nah, that had nothing to do with the inspiration, I'm like, are you sure? It's kind of bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Huh? But honestly, like, I think the reason they didn't show the Phantasm as much as they could have, it was to leave that illusion. Like, everything was supposed to be going on in the background, that it wasn't supposed to be, like, oh, yeah, it's going to be in your face. Whole... No, it's been just kind of subtle. It's that mystery. It really was enough for the movie. But I, I think also I would have liked it if there would have been more more Phantasm stuff. I know there was a sequel in a comic book form where Arthur Reeves does come back, and I believe the Joker does come back. Well, you can't kill the Joker. Yeah. Like, yeah. honestly, like, if she survived, obviously he did. They probably all happened the same way Bruce did, got swept out to sea. Makes yeah. most sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I have seen the Phantasm in was a Justice League episode, and it was supposed to have something to do with um, Amanda Waller that right. creates the Batman Beyond project. She injects Terry McGinnis's dad with some gene-altering formula that basically make Terry McGinnis a, a Bruce Wayne clone, and the Phantasm was hired to kill Terry McGinnis's parents, but she backed out of it. And she doesn't even say anything, and it's just a couple... Maybe We're lucky if we see her for a minute. And that was it. But there are comics, and I just saw an article where they said they are going to make the Phantasm more canon now in the Batman storylines. And, and I thought, awesome. I'll, I'd love to see Phantasm in a live action. I would too. I think it would be a fun story. Absolutely. Like, okay. honestly, like the way that they're rebuilding the whole uh, DC universe, basing it off of like the comics and everything, like using Flashpoint, which happened like 10 years ago, they were able to bring new stuff back, so it's like they just brought Watchmen into the DC universe about a year ago. So they used that breakoff point to bring those back. So they might actually end up doing that again too. Like they may have disappeared, they may have died, but we can also bring them back through this whole event yeah. that happened. There's a lot of stories I haven't been told yet. I would love to see a Red Hood film, or at least Red Hood be injected into the storyline, as well as Deathstroke. I want to see Deathstroke in oh, yeah. a Batman film, Hell a live yeah. action Batman film. I'm not talking about Titans on the DC streaming service. I'm talking about Deathstroke as in a live action movie. Oh, I think it'd be fun, dude. Like, there's so much they have that they're not using. Like, don't get me wrong, Joker's an amazing villain, but he's overdone. Oh, yeah. Yes, he uh, is. Catwoman, Penguin, those are all ones we've already known about. Bring something new to the table. Like, we got to see Bane better off but they ended up giving fucking what's her face uh apparently robert pattinson's gonna be facing off against six villains listen in, i'm in still not agreeing that i know batman yet. i know because you're still attached to ben affleck which yes. i am too because he was great <laughs> in the scenes for batman v superman i'm curious to see what robert pattinson can do in matt reeves batman film because matt reeves is a great director and he did assemble a good talented cast and they have begun filming the movie but like we said, there are so many characters in this lore that have yet to be explored and given screen presence in a live action movie. I welcome a Mask of Phantasm live action movie. I'd also like to see Mr. Freeze come back and done well this time. Yes. Because he, he's another one of those characters that can be a villain and a hero. Like he could be... Tragic hero. He could be the guy who's 
causing the problems, but then sacrifices himself at the end and dies because he realizes he's not a bad guy. That's the kind of character he is. It's more of a villain of circumstance. Like, they turned him into this. And as for, like, one other nitpicky, as I said into before, I wish we had more scenes with Commissioner Gordon and maybe even Barbara Gordon. At least them not so much as being way pushed off to the side, like one or two scenes in the movie, that's it. I would have liked to have seen Commissioner Gordon more as a presence, maybe in the scenes where the cops are gunning down Batman and he's trying to do everything he can to stop them from doing this. Like, no, you have the wrong guy. L- stop, put your guns down. He is not the enemy. Or like him trying to conflict with, maybe Batman is doing this. Maybe he has snapped. Has he truly gone off the deep end at this moment? Something, com- I don't know, maybe I feel like they could have done something more with Commissioner Gordon rather than him just being pushed off to the side in one or two scenes. I think he could have contributed a little bit more to an already great story. Yeah, that's pretty all pretty much saying. just seems like he just like, nope, washed his hands of it, like, fuck off, I'm done. Right, that, that's <laughs> I'm like, I feel like that's something he wouldn't do. I feel yeah, like the, he'd be involved. Look at this one, they even wrote out Robin, right? Like, dude, <laughs> fucking, he's well, not even in it. Like, he's apparently in college during this movie, I think. He's nobody like cares. Universe, I know, no one cares, but he's <laughs> off, saying, he's the, fact off that the they, university. They could have just, like, stated, like, oh, can, do you want me to call him Master Grayson? No, fuck off, he's in college. <laughs> just do something like that. Like, I'll smack the shit out of him later. <laughs> Jeff, do you have any least favorite nitpicky? Honestly, no. Like, I, I can't even really bitch. I think the funniest thing is, like, drawing the red smile on Joker. I'm like, really? That's, uh, that's all it fucking takes, <laughs> really? But, like I said, nitpicky. Like, that was, like, yeah. I don't, like an obvious thing. Yeah. But the, the movie as a whole is, like, a solid. Like, I enjoy it. I'm still, like, I guess I'm probably going to watch it later. <laughs> well, well, I don't know if you remember, but when we were growing up and hanging out, we watch that movie religiously that was a go-to movie for yeah. us all the time you showed it to me like i think you, six years ago yeah i never you, saw it you never saw it ago, until it i me. introduced you to it because mm-hmm. it had a really cool catchy title and you were like what is this and i was like you never saw this and we sat down and watched it and you were like damn man that was fucking great <laughs> i i did have to laugh at the, like as i'm like researching this a little bit more i found out that kenner ended up spoiling the movie for a lot of people because but, they released the toys without the mask so it's like it ended up spoiling the ending for the movie which honestly like there's a lot of things that happen like lego's done already to disney funko a lot of things like that so it's like the toys they should probably at least wait or just kind of like give out something in the beginning not just fucking oh here you go by the way this is happening (laughs) well there was no marketing for the movie they just bolded it out real quick and tell you the truth i don't even really remember the trailers, I think I remember it being on some other movie that, like, my mom or sister had. And maybe I did see see it premiere before a movie in the theater, but... I don't recall that. Yeah, I don't really remember all. a whole lot. Hell, Honestly. hell, Siskel and Ebert didn't even review it until Batman Forever came out because it was in and out so fast. And they even said, this was a huge mistake, us not reviewing this movie, mm-hmm. because... They said they really liked it. They might have had like a trailer during one of the episodes. Like, oh, by the way, this movie's coming out. McDonald's had Happy Meals, and very faintly, it said on the box, Batman Mask of the Phantasm in theaters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's ridiculous. Oh, like, God. dude, it, how, how good this movie is. Like, it's like they kind of screwed it up. That's man. why people have viewed it as very underrated, because some people, it's just flown under the radar to them. <laughs> and Batman Forever was the beginning of the downfall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for the longest time after Batman and Robin, Batman fans, including myself, were so hungry for another Batman movie. Well, yeah, that... when you left it the way they did with, like, fucking how bad fucking Bane, Mr. Freeze, like, it, it, was, it was such a bad taste in our mouth. Boom! I think the best thing that came out of that movie was probably fucking um, Uma, Uma Thurman, Thurman as Poison Ivy. <laughs> Oh my god! Yeah, even that no, was, she was. They oh. had some cheesy shit with her, but it's like, but she fit in it. Yeah, like, I mean, she she really did fit with. It's like Adam West in that Batman. Like you can't put him in a Tim Burton Batman. No, Batman. I would still the, watch it. I would watch it. Yeah, me too. Me too. I would totally watch that shit. But uh, Joker, you can't do that. <laughs> but no, she really did fit in that movie, and her performance was very good it actually stood out above everybody else even having arnold in there it's like yo this is bad when she's out shining you buddy you were just one-liners today i honestly thought alicia silverstone's batgirl performance was 
horrendous? No, <laughs> the underdog. I was like, this. she's giving the most subtle performance that actually ended up being the best for me. Because she probably had, a, like, <laughs> ten minutes of screen time because no one gave a shit. <laughs> like, oh, by the way, she's Batgirl. We don't know why she's here. Yeah, and you got to see Uma's legs in that movie a lot. I was too busy laughing about the fact that they showed so much bat ass and bat nipples. Uh, when they got Uma's legs, I was like, Phew. there are large, protrusive <laughs> bat nipples in the movie. <laughs> oh my god. Anyway. <laughs> oh my, you're like, anyway. Anyway. Oh, yeah, guys, if you haven't seen this movie, Go check it. I mean, you've already listened to the podcast already, but seriously, go check this movie out now. It's 75 minutes, as we said. It's an easy watch. It's breathlessly paced. It's brilliant. It is. It, I, was it nominated for an Oscar? Not an Oscar. It was nominated for an Annie for Best Animated Film, and it lost out to The Lion King. It's actually the only comic book cartoon movie that actually got nominated. I yeah. know uh, Batman the Animated Series had also won Emmys. It yeah. did win Emmys, yes. So, with the longevity of the animated series, how great this movie is, it's for kids, it's for adults, it's such a well-loved and well-liked movie. Like, this was the go-to movie when we were so hungry for another Batman movie that I think that's why it kind of got brought back into the frame. Because people said, we want another Batman movie, but we only got 89 and returns that are good. But we got Phantasm, and it's like, oh, yeah, let's rewatch this. And that, I think that's kind of what started it. Mm-hmm. And it was just organic like yeah. that. And I'd say, honestly, that, like we may talk about this movie later. The other one that always comes to mind, other than Phantasm, is Return of the Joker in the Batman Beyond series. Like That was probably the best one of Batman yeah, Beyond. Like, as, yeah. as much as, like, while the animated series was, Batman Beyond wasn't comparable, but yet they tried to use the same animation. Mm-hmm. You did get Kevin Conroy to come back to play old man. Which Bruce was Wayne. smart because Kevin Conroy is synonymous to the Batman character. Oh, yeah, just like, dude, he's probably going to play him until he fucking dies. He's in the video games. Know, he voices man. the video games too and the Arkham Knight games and Arkham uh, City. I would oh, say, yeah. come on, look, they even did the, the killing joke. Him and Mark Hamill as Batman and Joker, probably one of the best. They came back in 2016, yep, yeah. to do that movie. Those two together are always going to be Batman and Joker. Like, I'm going to say that always because, honestly, like, they put on such an amazing performance. Like, even with Joker only being in it for, what, maybe, like, 20 minutes, if give or take, he About. did stand out the most because, like, the one-liners, the way he puts so much emotion into it, it's just, like, that's what we wanted. The laughing, the writing for his character, all of it. Yeah, like, they did an amazing job, just Mark Hamill alone, just standing out. Like, being 77 minutes, he stood out for those 20, that's what it was. Like, mm-hmm. even Kevin Conroy putting so much emotion into, like, even those really heartfelt moments, like, trying to figure out if he's Batman or if he wants to be with Andrea, that's what we wanted. It's an actual Batman movie. It was yeah. the first time it was focused on Batman. I mean, until we got Batman Begins, we actually started getting that origin story and how he came to fruition as this character. But this was the very first movie that we got that was solely a Batman movie. And it tugged with your heart. You saw a different side of Bruce Wayne. And it was great. It was so neat to see, wow, he still has a side that wanted to have a normal life. But now you understand, because of this situation, why he can't be with Selena. Why he can't be with Talia. Why he's also cold to, you know, Robin. Well, oh, fuck Robin, all right? <laughs> fuck Robin, all right? <laughs> Shut up, Robin. Get the fuck out of here, Robin. <laughs> because, you know, for anybody who's gone through a bad breakup, it really sucks losing somebody you love. Or if somebody passes away, it it's hurtful. Nothing wants to marry him. I wanted to marry her. And it was a life changing thing. I mean, he probably wouldn't be Batman because of that. Will Batman ever get married? <laughs> Actually, he does. He does. He does marry Catwoman, and then she divorces him. Oh. Oh. Uh. <laughs> I feel like I could go another hour <laughs> about talking about Batman. Really could. Batman in general. Yeah. Honestly, that could be a whole other episode. Yeah. Like, truthfully, like, this movie alone just. This one and possibly Return of the Joker could probably have their own episodes because 
they're it's mm-hmm. an amazing movie. I'm like I, I'm still like just wanting to talk about like we're all gonna like, watch it after I we're know, done. I, uh, <laughs> it's like Die Hard. We're gonna it's, it's, after all the talk. It's like I gotta watch it again. <laughs> and I will say I gave it a lot of thought for a favorite scene. Because it was so hard. There's so many good ones between the art, the music, the emotions. But one that I've even had to like look back on and say, you know, I always make sure I watch this one scene. And it's the scene where he's in the back cave and he puts on the mask for the first time. That's my favorite scene. Because he's just all black. There's no lights. You see a younger Alfred. He's not expecting to see what he sees afterwards. And Batman looking at the mask yet, and the music playing, that Danny Elfman, Shirley Walker combo, and when it elevates, it's like, oh my god, this was so perfect. Mm-hmm. It was perfect. For me, it was definitely the, the scene towards the very end when Batman discovers that Andrea is the phantasm, and they have, it, it felt like the entire movie was building up to this one scene where you have two characters that could not be more similar except one goes down a different path and the other one chooses another path. One chooses vengeance, the other one chooses justice. And it's these conflicting tones where they come together and they realize they can't be together. And it's sad and it's heartbreaking because Bruce wants to lash out, but he can't as Batman because he does love her this entire movie has been building to this scene of the final reveal of the phantasm and it's not who Bruce wants it to be but it is and now he has to live with it it's devastating but it's again brilliant that would be my favorite scene actually mine's the introduction of the Joker the whole situation with him and I want to keep on with Falcone, but... Sal? Yeah. Sal. That, that, such an Italian name. But... <laughs> you should know. <laughs> but it's like, the whole situation, like, Joker being the Joker, still over the top, and just like, even like you said, like, he felt disgusted when he touched him, like, don't touch me. Yeah. Like, that whole situation was amazing. But the one thing that I laughed about, when he's showing him the place and the robot wife, <laughs> and the piece breaks off, Without even acknowledging that broke off, he sticks in his pocket. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> and I'm laughing about this because, so like, the whole time I'm like, that's actually, like, the funniest part of that whole situation. Because he's, like, he's talking to Sal. And also he's just like, oh, yeah, that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> sure, she's a real homebody, but you can't help who you fall in love with. Oh. oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Save this for later. <laughs> this is her cheek a little too much. <laughs> oh, man. And the intro with when he goes into Arthur's. Uh, office building that was great the ending when batman's on the ledge Mm -hmm. that was great phantasm's intro there's there's so much great stuff and it's just just like not one boring part to this at all it, it moves at a breakneck pace it really does it's tight and it doesn't feel like you're constricted either it's got enough breathing room to let you like enjoy it you know, it's not... Oh, oh, oh. The pacing's perfect. It's smooth. Like you said, not rushed. It's literally just perfect. One other thing I forgot to mention, the inspiration behind the cartoon was also the Max Fleischer Superman cartoons. Those old serials, if you look at the body styles, that's the main inspiration for the way the characters looked okay. for the animated series of Batman. Yeah. They were cartoony, but they stood out. Like, they gave them different body proportions and it made the women look like women. Certain guys be lanky, tall, built, whatever. So they're actually going with body styles, yes. not like, oh, we're all built. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't like the same old generic stuff like you saw in G.I. Joe or Masters of the Universe. Like, they said they were tired. <laughs> But that is Batman Mask of the Phantasm. We all can't recommend this movie enough. We've actually talked a lot about good movies on the show lately. I think we're due for a couple bad ones, as hard as that's going to be to watch. (laughs) We've got a couple in in mind right now. Listen, I don't know if I can sit through another fucking Showgirls, (laughs) because... I think the anniversary should be Showgirls, too, Pennies from Heaven. I'm going to murder whoever fucking made that movie, okay? I could probably film it better on my phone. Probably not hard to find. Oh, uh, yeah. I 
do the episode just on the trailer because that trailer was so bad. Uh, Film school students do ten times better than. But honestly, I I'm happy that everyone is actually watching our stuff or listening. Yes, yeah. we all really appreciate you guys enjoying our channel and really liking what we're doing. Please feel free to comment more. Find us on Facebook. We're all on Facebook individually. Cinema Sanitarium Productions has its own Facebook page. We also have Twitter. Feel free to contact us out there. We're trying to come up with some different ideas and fun little things for you guys because we want to make it fun. We want to make it intellectual for you. And we absolutely love doing this. Yeah, honestly, we were talking about this earlier. Like, it originally just started three smart asses sitting in my basement talking about movies. And honestly, that's what it is. That's the feel. We enjoy movies this much that, like, we can talk about it. Like, hell, like, these two probably know a hell of a lot more than I ever will because of going to school for it. I'm just so opinionated. It's amazing. But <laughs> you've got some favorites. There are some clear favorites of ours <laughs> that request you. <laughs> I think we're going to have to make a shirt with you, Jeff, because this movie's just fucking shit. <laughs> well, I believe the other one was, so you're going to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> but we we appreciate everything you guys have done. Like, hell, dude, I'm still trying to figure out why Showgirls is, seven, what, 75,000 right now? Something like that, yeah. Something ridiculous. I'm I'm still trying Less to figure this year. out. But we appreciate everything you guys have done. Like, you just have fun with us just let us know what you would like us to do how if you give us a request we will answer we'll try to do it with our next episode who knows do a questionnaire episode we don't care any of you guys have anything else to add to our batman mask of the phantasm episode this movie's great <laughs> yeah I, i'm just shaking my head wow <laughs> i'm like oh yeah we're on camera no <laughs> <laughs> no i'm good <laughs> all righty so with that being said we are going to sign off. This is Colin Peters. John Rochetter. And Jeff Manfred. And we shall see you all again next session. Stay crazy, y'all. Uh, please, somebody help me. <laughs>